Certainly a privilege to be before you once more. Thankful for the elders for allowing me this opportunity to speak before you. Throughout the New Testament, we can find mention of several different baptisms. Now, if we fail to understand each of them, what they are, what they mean, we can come, become confused and eventually fall into error, as many have before us. Now, this morning, I would like for us to study these different baptisms. Now, as with many occasions, it is a good idea to define the terms we're using. Baptism is not a sprinkling or pouring, as many would use today, as even Webster's would help define us. But we're concerned more about what God has to say about this particular word. The word used means, in every case of our study, an immersion, a dipping, an overwhelming, and a submersion. <clears throat> the first baptism for us to consider this morning is Israel's baptism. We find first mention of this in Exodus chapter 14. This, of course, is referring to the Red Sea crossing. And if you Exodus chapter 14, verses 9 through 19 through 22, says, And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud of uh, a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, speaking of Israel, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the, the, the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. We're quite familiar with this passage, this account of Israel leaving their Egyptian captors. But later in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 2, Paul references this account. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not have ye be ignorant, <clears throat> how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So they were baptized. The whole nation of Israel, well, really before they were a nation, but that whole group of people, those Israelites, were baptized unto Moses. Now, keep in mind, this is something Paul expected his readers to know. He was, if you would, stirring their minds up to remembrance. Now, this was not just a miraculous event that actually occurred, but it's, it was used for type, the baptism to come. Paul is showing us how we are to use that account in its application. Is true meaning for us today. The Red Sea was not simply a crossing; it was not just a method of travel for these Israel, excuse me, these Israelites into another land. To the children of Israel, this crossing of the Red Sea, this immersion, was the end of their Egyptian captivity. The yoke of Egyptian bondage was then broken. You can read further in that that account where. Pharaoh sent his armies, and they were all destroyed by the same water that allowed them to be free. One cannot help but call to mind Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. We all know what that passage says. You know, keep in mind the straight gate, straight and narrow way as we often refer to it. Do you reckon if someone decided to go a different route than where Moses had opened through God's power? You reckon if they went another route that they'd be saved? Certainly not. There was only one gate. There was only one opening in that Red Sea. And it was for the children of Israel. And as we noted previously, the Egyptians that pursued were completely destroyed. 
Now, if God was able to take care of his children then, would he not now? Our second baptism. We'll call it the pre-Pentecost baptism. We're introduced to this by the forerunner of Christ, John the Baptizer. This was a baptism in water and was for the remission of sins. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. We find it says there, in, the, in those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sins. So as we've stated before not this lesson in particular but we all know what a forerunner is. It's not a pickup truck made by Nissan. The idea of a forerunner is to announce the coming of someone greater than that forerunner. It's usually in reference to a king or a, a ruling party. In this instance, it would be the King of Kings, Jesus the Christ. But nonetheless, John the Baptist had a job to do, and that was to call Israel to repentance. Now we see in John chapter 3, verse 23, why he chose this area, the Jordan River. It's because there was much water there. Now keep in mind our definition of baptism. It's an immersion. Whoever is being baptized is completely immersed in that element, in this case, is water. You can't do that in a little creek, like Spring Creek out here. Even maybe when it floods, you might find other things. But the idea is you need plenty of water to bury someone in. This was the perfect spot for him to do his work. Now, this baptism was designed to call Israel to repent of their sins under the law of Moses. They had... Fallen, they have forgotten their first love, in this case would be God. They were disobedient to Him. And they need to be called back to Him. John goes on to say in Matthew chapter 3, still there in verses 7 and 8, says, But when he, or I'm sorry, when, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, or meet for repentance. Now this gives us a better idea of what it is really meant by repentance. What is expected of us when we do repent. It is not simply or merely an apology for doing wrong. And it is not a half-hearted sob story that one puts out. There is action required on our part. Now certainly we should be sorry for the things we've done for the sins we've committed. But everyone is going to see that there is a change in our life and our way of thinking. True repentance. We must also know that this baptism was designed to end. It was this baptism that was, called, that was to cause the Israelites to prepare for the coming kingdom. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's coming. It's near. Matthew chapter 3 verse 2. And we find later in Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 28, that Apollos was diligently preaching God's word, but he only knew the baptism of John. Now, thankfully, Aquila and Priscilla were there to teach him better. They instructed him further in the things that he needed to know. Now, by this time, as evidenced by Acts 18, the baptism of John was no longer binding. The next baptism we'd like to take a look at is the suffering baptism, baptism, particularly of that of Jesus. In Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 39, we find Jesus foretelling his own future regarding how he would be treated in Israel or Jerusalem. It says, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatever so we, or whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that, that I should do for you? And they said unto him, 
Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. Verse 38, Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with, with all shall ye be baptized. Now in literature, that would be a form of foreshadowing. For indeed, they would be baptized with the same baptism Jesus was baptized with. We can also find this account in Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 23. And this is also referenced in Luke chapter 12, verse 50. Now, prior to this conversation, Jesus had told his apostles, told his disciples that he would be led to Jerusalem and he would be enduring mocking, scourging, and he would eventually be spat upon. That does not sound like my idea of a good time. Nonetheless, Jesus knew that was coming for him. Now, a few moments ago, we remembered the Lord's death as we partook of the Lord's Supper. That is, after all, the supper that he instituted. Are you mindful of the things that he endured which happened during his crucifixion? Matthew 27, verse 26, we know that he was scourged. He wasn't whipped like many kids nowadays need. His flesh was rendered from his body. He was mocked. Matthew chapter 27, verse 27 through 31. Now that might not sound like much to us, but keep in mind who he is. He's the very son of God. And these people are saying, oh, great king. Well, is he not the great king? Absolutely. But they're doing it to make fun of him. He was stripped. We can read from this passage. He, he had his robe stripped from him. Now, this was after he was whipped. Now, if you've ever removed a Band-Aid rather quickly, you know, that kind of hurts. But have you ever removed a bandage from a bleeding wound after it's kind of soaked in for a little bit? That's what happened to Jesus. He had bleeding wounds due to the things that he had suffered, put his clothes back on, and then they stripped him again. Don't you think that hurt him? Don't you think that's embarrassing to have yourself stripped in front of all these soldiers? Then he was given a crown of thorns to wear. Not just wear, but they smashed it on his head. Now, whenever somebody thinks, when they tell me thorns, I think of the mesquite trees we had in, in Cameron. You had thorns three, four inches long. That's what I picture when they had made that crown for my Savior. And he had to wear it. And they smushed it on his head. Do you think that went into his flesh? He was also spat upon. They also hit him with a reed in the head. Now, do you think they were, they were holding back any? Do you think they were being nice to my Savior, your Savior, when they were abusing him? Certainly not. We just read for the scripture to prepare our minds for that Lord's Supper. How Simon the Cyrenian was compelled to carry his cross. Is it any wonder he needed help? This same suffering that you can read about for yourself was an immersion. If anybody ever wanted baptism to be a sprinkling or a pouring, don't you think Jesus would have preferred that? Here's a little bit of pain. Here's a little bit of pain. But no, he was completely immersed in it, in that suffering. Ultimately, he was murdered on the cross. Truly, he was baptized in suffering. Next, for your consideration, Holy Spirit baptism. Now, this is one that I'm sure that many of us are familiar with in various abuses today. But John the baptizer foretold that Christ would baptize with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 3 verse 11. 
Jesus would later apply this, this baptism, to his apostles. John chapter 14, verse 26. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 26, and was, as well as John chapter 16, verse 13. So it was given to a, a specific group of individuals. Now Jesus told his apostles to remain in Jerusalem until they received his promise, which was to receive the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and verse 8. On the first Pentecost following the, the crucifixion, we see this promise being fulfilled. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And we're all familiar with that account. They were given the ability to speak in tongues. At least that's the first manifestation. That's what all those people heard. They heard everyone, or these men, speaking in their native tongue. We also note that even though Paul became an apostle later, he too received the same promise. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 5, and verse 12. We find in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48, that the household of Cornelius also received the Holy Spirit. We would point out that receiving the Holy Spirit was not, keep in mind, was not a condition of salvation. It was merely a tool, not merely, but it was simply a tool to confirm the truth and to help grow the church at that time. Because we find later in that account that they still needed to be baptized. More on that later. Now beyond the apostles, one only received the Holy Ghost by having the apostles' hands laid on them. Acts chapter 8, verse 15 through 17. You will not find any other method in Scripture of this transference. So those claiming to use miracles or use the Holy Ghost today, they're either apostles themselves or there's some really old apostles out there that we need to go meet because they claim to have these miracles. But those folks are liars. They're not performing real miracles, nor can they. Now you can find the list of these nine gifts of the Holy Ghost in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Paul outlines them there. Now it's interesting to note that just having a gift of the Holy Spirit does not and did not override their free will. These first century brethren were misusing the gifts which, we, the, which they have received. Thus you had three possibilities. To use them correctly, to abuse them or misuse them, or to neglect them altogether. As humans we could do those things. And Paul wrote to them, to use them properly. Now many today would prefer, or they at least claim to use, the Holy Spirit as their guide because He works directly on them to alter their life or to basically run everything in their life. Some even claim to have the power to perform miracles. These people need to read Matthew chapter 22, verse 29. It says, Jesus answered and said unto them, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. We are told by Paul that in time these gifts would cease. Yes, we are given a timeline for the end of miracles. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 12 says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, <clears throat> I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also am known. I was having a discussion with a lady. It's been many years now. And I was trying to, te to tell her that miracles had ended. And she used or pointed out that there in verse 8 that knowledge hasn't vanished away, so therefore miracles exist. And clearly tongues haven't ceased. People talk all they want. 
Well, keep in mind, this isn't talking about the physical abilities that we have, how we come to know things. This is miraculous knowledge. This is mir the miraculous gift of speaking in tongues. <clears throat> now, just what is that, quote, perfect that is to come? We find this answered in James chapter 1, verses 23 through 25. It says, For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh in the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. When the child mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13, particularly 8, 8 through 12, is grown, there would be no more need for the guiding hand of the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, do you think it's a coincidence that James uses the same analogy of a mirror as Paul? He pulled the glass but darkly, but then face to face. And then James points out when we look into the perfect law of liberty, it's a mirror. It's a mirror. It shows us for what we truly are, how God sees us and how God sees sin. You reckon there's the same author being exposed here? It's almost as, as if one author is discussing the same topic. Now with regards to those that claim the Holy Spirit operates directly on them today, they go a few steps beyond Scripture. In their mind, the Holy Spirit runs their lives. Now think about that. Through implication, they're saying the Holy Spirit causes them to sin. If not, just helping them to sin. Now I think some of them realize this implication. Some of them probably not because they, they might not do as much thinking as they should. Which is evidenced by the claim that they hold. But... I, I think many of them think this application through. I think in their minds, since the Holy Spirit is running my life, it's His fault for me sinning. You can't blame me, God. After all, we see that from Adam and Eve, and specifically Adam in the garden. God, it's your fault. The woman that you gave me, she did cause me to eat. You see, if I, were, if I blame the Holy Spirit, I can't go to hell. Again, that's the implication, the conclusion to their line of thinking. Next is fire baptism. Again, John the baptizer also stated that Jesus would baptize in fire. Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 through 12. It says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Speaking of John the Baptist. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. No doubt this baptism is referencing hell, the eternal abode of the wicked any and all who are in rebellion to their Creator. We find from other scriptures that hell is, <clears throat> hell is described as a fire that is not quenched. Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 48. Hell is the vengeance of God. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 9. Hell is also the second death. Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. Therefore, all of us, must use the time that we've been given in this life to search for God, to seek out His will for us, and to be obedient to it. So we ask, are you the wheat or are you the chaff? Because the chaff is going to be burned up one day. The wheat's going to be gathered. <clears throat> How we live in this life determines where we will end up in eternity. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Now, if you've ever burned anything, like I have, and I'm sure many, many boys have at some point in their lives, whether it might be accidentally almost burning the house down, I thankfully never did that, 
But when you get that fire going, you look at the coals. Those, whatever you're burning, are completely engulfed in those flames. Whatever you're burning is baptized in fire. That is exactly what's going to happen to those who are in rebellion to God in hell. They will be completely immersed in fire, in spiritual fire, when this world is over. And finally, we will discuss the one baptism. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. There is one baptism. Now, we just talked about five of them. Which one would it be? Well, this is a different one. This is the baptism that remains in effect since the day of Pentecost. This is the baptism that is mentioned by Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. This is the baptism that will continue on throughout the end of this age. The one baptism is a burial in water. Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 38, or through 38. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. This one baptism is for the remission of sins. Not because of the remission of sins, but for the remission of sins. It's the act that actually removes them. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This one baptism is how the individual calls upon their Lord. Acts chapter 28, or 22, verse 16. And this one baptism is how one contacts the blood of Christ. Revelation 1, verse 5. Baptism is preceded by one's confession of faith. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Acts chapter 8, verse 37. And Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. Preceding that is repentance. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. As well as Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Before that, you must believe. And that's Romans chapter 8, 24. And the necessary action before that is hearing God's word. Romans 10, 17. Now, upon cl completing these, uh, these steps... One is now a qualified candidate for this one baptism. Now at the point of being baptized, that one individual is then saved. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. And at that point, that individual is also added to the church. Acts 2, verse 47. When we are baptized into Christ, we are baptized into his death. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Just what does that mean? Well, keep in mind what we discussed earlier about the suffering baptism. This is what we must all figuratively do to our old sinful life, our old sinful nature. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Have you crucified yourself? If you haven't, you're not fully obedient to God. Now that's not something that just happens one time. That's a continued lifestyle. <coughs> Excuse me. You must continuously put to death that old sinful nature. Because sooner or later, maybe some of those words you used to use, they'll come back to mind and, and they'll be jumping around, hey, pick me. No, get behind me, Satan. Some of the things that you might have wanted to participate in, you know, it could be anything. It could be going to a football game on Sunday morning where you should be worshiping with the brethren. You know, pick, pick anything. Those, those old habits, as they say, die hard. And it takes work to get past them. But nonetheless, they must happen. That old sinful nature must be crucified. If, of course, you want to remain faithful to God. Now, not only that, but it, it means that we arise from baptism a new creature. Therefore, we must maintain, work to maintain, our spiritual relationship as long as we draw breath. Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and Galatians verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 15. It does take work. 
It's not always easy, but it is worth it. Those faithful to God will be granted heaven, Revelation 2, verse 10. Now, if you're not a Christian this morning, the next few moments we deem as the invitation. And if you wish to respond, come do so. However, if, if you are a child of God, if you're a member of the blood-bought body of Christ, yet you have allowed sin back into your life, now is the time to take the steps to correct those things. Whether if it was a public sin or you just need prayers of congregation. If you need help in whatever the way or whatever the need is, please make it known as together we stand and sing.